Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In the last lecture of EC 2026, Introduction to Signal Processing, we started a mathematical analysis of an effect called aliasing. In this lecture, we'll talk about a particular kind of aliasing called folding. This lecture is basically part two of that previous lecture. So if you haven't already seen that lecture, I recommend you go watch it and then come back. In the last lecture, we introduced the idea of a digital frequency, where we took our frequency omega and multiplied it by the sample period, or equivalently, divided it by the sample rate. That gave us our omega hat. We saw that in the two-sided spectral domain, there are these aliases in omega hat land, where you can add or subtract multiples of 2 pi. Now, since we have these negative frequencies, we can think about adding or subtracting multiples of 2 pi from the negative frequency component. We'll see that this gives us a flip of the phase of the resulting sinusoid. We'll start with an example. Let's consider a cosine with a frequency of 100 hertz. If we sample it at a rate of 1 kilohertz, we can find the omega hat by taking 2 pi times 100, dividing it by 1,000, which gives us 2 pi times 0.1, or 0.2 pi. Now, the Nyquist rate for this signal is 200 samples per second. We're sampling well above that, so no weird aliasing happens. Now, what if we had a frequency of 1100 hertz and we sampled it at 1 kilohertz? Well, plugging in a 1 here would give me a 1 here, and that omega hat would go here. But remember, I can always add or subtract multiples of 2 pi inside of a cosine and get the same thing. So if I subtract 2 pi, that's equivalent to my original omega hat of 0.1. This is the sort of aliasing that we saw in the last lecture. Now, what about a 900 hertz wave? 900 divided by 1,000 gives me an omega hat of 0.9. Now let's subtract 2 pi n, which we know doesn't change the cosine. That would give me 2 pi times minus 0.1 n. Now, I know that cosine of negative something is equal to cosine plus that something. So here are three different frequencies, all sampled at 1,000 hertz, all gave us the same sequence of numbers inside the computer. Here we say that that 900 hertz folded to 100 hertz. This is a kind of aliasing. So let's think about this cosine. By the properties of the cosine function, I could put a plus here, a plus here, and a minus here. But L is representing a generic integer, so let me just do this. I'll put a plus here and a plus here. If L is equal to zero, that would be our usual cosine wave. Now, let's take this and sample it. So we'll replace T with N capital TS, where capital TS is our sample rate. Then we can multiply this through and regroup the terms. The sample rate is 1 over the sample period, so this all goes away. So now we can use this property that cosine minus whatever equals cosine or whatever to flip the sign on everything in the cosine. Here we have our now familiar friend, the integer multiple of 2 pi, which we can get rid of inside the cosine. So we get the same omega hat that we would have gotten if we just put in this frequency f. Let's visualize an example in the spectral domain. So we have a 100 hertz sinusoid. The Nyquist rate for that would be 200 hertz. So since we're sampling at 125, we're definitely undersampling, so we expect some kind of aliasing to go on. 2 pi times 100 divided by 125 gives me 1.6 pi, and I have the corresponding negative frequency line. And now I can think about the aliases. So that line at 1.6 pi aliases down 2 pi to land at minus 0.4 pi and the spectral line at minus 1.6 pi will go up 2 pi to land at 0.4 pi. And there's an infinite number of copies of these going either direction with spacings of 2 pi. Notice that when the aliases cross the vertical axis, they retain the property of having a star or not having a star, where that star represents the complex conjugate. And remember, when we're trying to figure out the phase of the cosine, we look on the right-hand side. So something that wasn't starred now has a star, 
and this corresponds to a sine flip of the phase term. Let's take a step back. The big picture is we want to take some analog signal X of T, digitize it to create a signal X of N, process it in some way to create an output Y of N that we turn back into a continuous time signal YT. So far, we haven't really talked about the signal processing part in the middle. We've basically talked about taking a real world signal, putting it into the computer, and trying to get the same signal back out. We'll talk about this part in the middle later in the course. Right now, let's talk about getting YT from YN. In the next lecture, we'll talk about how this is done in practice for general signals. But for right now, while we're trying to conceptualize things, where we have a sinusoidal formula for YN, we could just go backwards. Earlier, we went from T land to N land by taking T and replacing it with N divided by FS. So now we can go the other direction by taking N and replacing it with T times FS. For instance, if we have this formula for Y of N with an omega hat of 0.2 pi, and we have a sample rate of 8 kilohertz, we could replace N with 8000 T and wind up with a sinusoid in the continuous time domain of 800 hertz. Now you may be thinking to yourself, there's some evil lurking in here regarding aliases. We can always add or subtract multiples of 2 pi inside the cosine and get the same discrete time sequence. And if I follow this procedure of taking N and replacing it with T times the sample rate, I see that there's actually a whole bunch of frequencies that we could reconstruct. There's the original one I showed you on the previous slide, or you could equivalently add or subtract multiples of the sample rate from that frequency where the resulting negative frequencies would fold over. And without any additional assumptions, all of those frequencies would be equally valid reconstructions. So we need to make some assumptions. We decide to choose the lowest frequency sinusoid to give us the smoothest reconstruction. This corresponds to only reconstructing the spectral lines for omega hat falling between minus pi and pi. This is an example of aliasing we looked at in the previous lecture. We had a 100 hertz wave that we sampled at 80 samples per second. That gave us an omega hat corresponding to 2.5 pi. There's an infinite number of aliases either direction, but the one we're interested in is the one that lands here at 0.5 pi. Similarly, the conjugate copy down here at minus 2.5 has an alias that lands up here at minus 0.5 pi. Again, there's an infinite number going either direction, but that's the only one we care about. So when thinking about reconstruction, we look at the spectral lines between minus pi and pi. This theoretically corresponds to an ideal low-pass filter in the continuous time domain. We'll talk a little bit about that in the next lecture. Remember that our sample rate for this system was 80 hertz. So, just as we divided by the sample rate when going from omega land to omega hat land, to go from omega hat land to omega land, we multiply it by the sample rate. So we'll take this 0.5 pi and multiply it by 80 in order to get 40 pi radians per second. If I want to know the resulting frequency in hertz, I divide by 2 pi, and I wind up seeing 20 hertz. So 100 hertz went in, 20 hertz came out. And in general, unless you're going for some really weird special effect, that's not good. The highest frequency you can get out of one of these systems corresponds to an omega hat of pi. But I should warn you that the inequality in the sampling theorem is strict. So weird things happen if you try to sample a sinusoid whose frequency is exactly half the sample rate. In this example, our original signal here didn't have a star, and the alias we're reconstructing also doesn't have a star. So this isn't folding. We don't have that phase flip. So let's look at the folding example from earlier in this lecture, where we sampled a 100 hertz signal at 125 samples per second. This gave us an omega hat of 1.6 pi. The aliases landed at 0.4 pi and minus 0.4 pi. I should clarify, these are the aliases we care about. There are an infinite number of aliases either direction, but we only care about the ones between 
minus pi and pi. So we're reconstructing a way for the alias that lands at 0.4 pi. When we take that 0.4 pi and multiply it by that sample rate of 125 hertz, we wind up with an omega of 50 pi. Dividing by 2 pi, that gives us a reconstructed frequency of 25 hertz. But notice that the alias here on the right came from the left-hand side, and the alias here on the left came from the right-hand side. And when the aliases cross the vertical axis like this, they keep their star or the lack thereof. So now a star has appeared here where they has it before. So while we had a plus phi up here, we have a minus phi down here. The phase has flipped its sign. In one of the previous lectures, we looked at chirp signals. And if you try to simulate a chirp signal that's an upward going signal, but then you violate the sampling theorem, you wind up with a situation where you'll hear the tone go up, but then you'll hear it go down in frequency, and then you'll hear it go up again. The place where you hear it going down in frequency corresponds to that folding effect. And when you hear it going up again, that corresponds to aliasing without folding. There's an example of this on the DSP First website. Let's scroll down to chapter four on sampling, chirp synthesis demo. So here you'll see a case where the chirp is going from zero to three kilohertz. We're sampling at 8,000 hertz, so we don't get any aliasing. Now, if we sample at 6,000 hertz, that's exactly the Nyquist rate for the signal. If we undersample, then we get this folding effect and let's actually listen to the waveform where we have no aliasing, aliasing with folding, and then aliasing without folding. Let's check out these strobe movies. So in both of these movies, the camera is recording at 30 frames per second. We're going to start with the disc spinning slowly. And as it spins faster and faster, the camera has trouble keeping up. At some point, it will start to look like the arrow is actually turning the opposite direction. That's folding. Oh, wait, no, now we're not folding. Now we're going back counterclockwise again. That was fun. Basically, the disc is spinning counterclockwise. So whenever it looks like it's going clockwise, that's a folding effect. around there. Yeah, it's complicated. Here on the right, we have a situation where because one spike is basically indistinguishable from another spike, it really accentuates all the weirdnesses associated with aliasing. It's kind of hypnotic. Okay, that's wild. The website also has these synthetic strobe movies. I'm not going to go over these in details here, but you should go to the website and check these out and think about what they're doing. Whoa. Wild. In all these cases, the disc is actually rotating in a counterclockwise direction at a constant speed. The SP First Toolbox includes this con 2 disk demo where you can set an input frequency, set a sampling rate, choose a phase, and look at the input signal, the sampled signal, the reconstructed signal, and the various spectra. I should mention there are some applications where you do alias on purpose and use aliasing's ability to essentially move bits of the frequency spectrum around to your advantage. But those are fairly specialized, so I won't be talking about them here. 